Hey, this is Steve Sims, and I've been called by Forbes the real Wizard of Oz. I'm on the Dove Baron Leadership Show, and I'm going to give you tips on how to fire the vampires out of your life, contact people, and be transparent. It works. Stay tuned. Congratulations. You are tuned into Dove Barron's Leadership and Loyalty Show, the number one podcast for Fortune 500 executives and those who are dedicated to creating a quantum leap in leadership. Your host, Dove Barron, is the founder of FullMontyLeadership.com. He's an executive mentor to leaders like you, a contributing writer for Entrepreneur Magazine, CEO World, and he's been featured on CNN, Fox, CBS, and many other notable sites. Dov Barron is an international business speaker who was named by Inc. Magazine as one of the top 100 leadership speakers to hire. Now, over to Dov Barron. Welcome, dear friends, fans, and fellow aficionados of leadership excellence. My name is Dov Barron, and I'm here to connect you with your deep greatness. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Dov Barron's Leadership and Loyalty Tips for Executives, part of the Full Monty Interview Series, where today we're going to take an insider look at doing what you're not qualified to do. If you're a new listener, a new viewer, thank you for joining us. Strap yourself in. We're about to go full Monty. If you're a regular, big thank you to you for making us the number one podcast globally for Fortune 500 listeners. And we're also honored by Inc.com, to, who made us the number one podcast to listen to to make you a better leader. Today may be an exception, but we'll find out. And thank you for sharing the show with everybody you know. Remember, we always need your help in staying relevant, so please get yourself over to iTunes. Rate review and subscribe to the show. All right, let's strip it down and dive right in. As a leader, whether you're a CEO, C-suite leader, sales leader, entrepreneur, leader in any capacity, being a leader requires vision and oftentimes giant cojones. But with giant cojones also comes maximum risk and maximum reward. How do you know the difference? How do you know which is which? Well, stay tuned because our guest today is Steve Sims. Steve Sims and I met about eight years ago and to say the lad has a bit of a presence, well, might be a bit of an understatement. I remember walking into a room um, in this, we were at a conference together. It was full of all these high flying speakers and entrepreneurs and, and all these guys. And many of them were in suits and ties. And I was not because I don't wear those kinds of things. And I felt a bit odd because I just, you know, it was these high types and I looked over and I saw this guy with a shaved coconut, a goatee, an earring in his eyebrow, and earrings in his ears. And I went, okay, at least there's another guy here with earrings. I knew I was in the right place. Steve Sims is the founder of the luxury concierge service called Bluefish. The things he and his company have done are legendary. Before you meet him, you probably have images that that conjures up when you think about some of the things he's done. But I promise you, whatever those images are, it's contradictory to who he is. He has arranged exclusive um, trips to the Titanic for his clients. He's done a wedding at the Vatican. He has a private dinner parties at the feet of Michelangelo's David in Florence, um, as well as while being serenaded by, you know, some guy by the name of Andrea Bocelli or something. You've probably heard of him. He throws an annual party with, uh, with none other than Sir Elton John for the Oscars. Uh, his company has been featured in the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, twice, Rob Report, Entrepreneur, Forbes, NPR, Hollywood Reporter, Variety, Fox News, NBC, I mean, all over the places. And now he's the author of a new book called Blue Fishing, The Art of Making Things Happen. Surprising because there are a few people who doubted whether he could even read. Little And by the way, I'm one of them because I sent him my book and I know he never read it. So please, ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together and welcome Steve Sims! Yeah! The crack Steve. Welcome, mate. Welcome, the lead up. <laughs> well, congratulations. It's now, there's now evidence that you can read because you created an audio book of your own book. So we know you've read something. That's that's true. That was one of those experiences I wish I hadn't actually done. Um, <laughs> There's a, as entrepreneurs, we like to try different things. So when I got offered to do the audio book and they said, hey, would you like to interview uh, for it? They actually asked me to interview for my for own book. book. I understand. I was like, yeah, all right, I'll try this. And, I, and they stick you in basically a port loo with loads of those rubber little triangles pointing at you. No air, no natural light. It, and I was in there for two days. At the end of the two days, 
Because when I did my first paragraph, a couple of paragraphs, it was novel. When they invited me down after day one, I was not looking forward to day two. I don't know if I'll ever do an audio book again, but it was painful. Yeah, I'm with you. I have not done, I keep asking, why, where's the audio book? Haven't done it, why? A, it takes a long time to do. It is laborious. It is hard work. And as you said, it's tough. I've tried it and I was like, I am feeling like I'm going a bit mental here. So I don't, I totally get it. Yeah, shoved in a little box. Yeah, it's, it's horrible. Now you've you've got this new book out, Blue Fishing. How you were telling me before we went on there? How many podcasts have you done? Sixty-two. Sixty-two. In how long? Uh, less than uh, about six weeks. So you're averaging ten a week. Oh, oh God, yeah. You know, I'm doing them on the weekends, and I never do anything on the weekend. But I'm doing on the weekends. I did one. My first one this morning was at seven o'clock. Then my next one was 10.45, and then there's this one. So today I've got three. Uh, you're my last, and then tomorrow I think I've got another two. Well, we're glad that you, you managed to do this one and, you, and that you're managing to do it without being supplied with the brown beverage. Yes, well, I thought I would start giving up slowly, so I've cut out drinking between the hours of 9 o'clock and 10 o'clock in the morning. Good lad. Good <laughs> lad. <laughs> Shivas. The breakfast of champions. <laughs> it is. It is. Yeah. Yeah. So tell, tell us, um, you know, I, I said for our listeners, the name of your company is Bluefish. Um, I'm not told what, what the company does, but what is blue fishing? Because, of course, that's your own phrase. So what, what is it? What does it mean? Well, um, I'd love to say that I calculated it and came up with it and it was all my idea. But um, it was my publisher. She she was having a chat with me on what we would do as a book. And I've been offered the chance to do a book many times throughout my 23 years of doing this. And every single book has been, we want you to talk about celebrities. We want you to talk about, you know, of Elon course. Musk, Richard Branson. And we were like, no, if I mention any clients' names, I'm dead by cocktail hour. So right. I can't do it. So this crowd contacted me and they said, well, look, why don't you do one? that encompasses some of the stories you've done, like the Vatican and Michelangelo and Elton John. But don't talk about so much of those. Preface it with those, but then go into the steps it took you to get that relationship, to work that contract, to build your brand. Um, so more of a how-to for dummies kind of thing, because right. I am a dummy. Um, and I like that concept. And she said she actually came out with it, Michelle. She said, oh, it's basically you're bluefish in everything. And I remember saying, well, what's that mean? And she said, well, you don't see any downside. You know, you're ignorant to the point of failure. You just do it. And then we started thinking, well, if bluefishing was that, then who would be famous bluefishers? And we were thinking, well, there's Sir Edmund Hillary, there's Elon Musk, uh, the people that refuse to, refuse to allow them falling down to define them, they allowed that to refine them. So that's how the whole blue fishing came up. And we hadn't really thought about it much, but when it came down to the book, um, Michelle, again, was the one that designed it. And she went, blue fishing, it's got to be what you do. It's got to be a state of mind. You're a blue fisher. You're blue fishing the crap out of something. And we went, we're going to run with it. So it was really cool. And as usual, I had nothing to do with it. <laughs> it's actually brilliant. I really like it. Now, yeah, it was pretty cool. One of the things that, you know, you, you and I were saying we were excited to come on together because we haven't caught up in a while. We used to talk quite a lot, and that was before you were famous. I mean, you were famous only in a select crowd. You were yeah, always I mean, famous right. in, in that select crowd. Everybody knew you, you, your missus, and your kids, and yeah. uh, Elon Musk and a couple of other people. But now you've become publicly famous. Now you're kind of out there, with, particularly with this book. Uh, what's that like for you? Because you, you've kind of been that guy who've been sort of a bit undercover, really, you know, because you don't look like the guy and you've been able to sort of not really, I mean, you don't you blend in like a pimple on your ass. I mean, you don't really blend in, but, you know, I mean, you didn't, you blend in in, in the scope of things around not looking like that celebrity guy. Yeah, I've always enjoyed the fact that I could go to events and, no one would know who I am and what I did and how the hell I got there. And 
I've had people literally come up to me before with empty drinks and go to hand me the empty drinks as though I was supposed to clear up the table. And I've had people come up to me saying, oh, we want to leave this party and then come back. And I'm stood there, I'm like, well, okay, why are you asking me? And they were like, well, I thought you were the best. <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay. So I've had that for many years and I've never cared about it. And my clients are millionaires and billionaires and zillionaires from around the world. So you're right. I'm 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 a you know pretty decent sized fish in a small pond, and all of a sudden people are now kind of getting to hear this and go, well, hang on a minute, he took over museums, you know, he organised a tea party with what? He got so and so to teach someone to play guitar, you know, just all of these things are coming out. Um, I've been been side smacked by the amount of videos. Uh, people are taking videos and sending them videos because I'm a great believer in video text. And they're sending them to me on Facebook and Messenger and stuff like that. People that I've never heard of. I got someone yesterday because I was on a TV show in um, Jerusalem earlier this year when I was uh, looking after some VIPs in uh, Israel and Jerusalem. And I was on these TV shows and they've only got four over there. And I was on all of them. Um, and then it was back, like back in England when we were there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When we had four channels. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and uh, when I was over there. I had uh, I, I got to know some people over and I hadn't spoken with them since. And then all of a sudden last week, I get all these photographs and videos where they're sitting in the bars and they're like, Steve, we got your book, you know, and they've ordered my book. And I'm thinking, damn, this is getting around. And then this book came out. This book came out on the 13th of October. OK, I don't know when this this is going live, but this book came out on the 13th of October Within a week of it coming out, I got a contract to actually have it translated in Mandarin and Taiwanese to go into the Asian market oh, because apparently God. it resonated with them. And That's I thought, amazing. how the hell can this be? So all of a sudden, there's going to be a bunch of people from all over the planet that, that are picking it up. And I, I, before I came on here, a gentleman by the name of Michael Clack, who's... Um, He's an annoying little shit. Um, he is in Australia and he's a fitness guru and uh, he's damn good at it. And I made a comment ages ago about I'm getting too fat because, you know, bit of the sauce and not enough uh, working out. He just jumped on my ass and he's like, try this just for 10 days, do it. And I listened to him, which I shouldn't have. I should have hung up on him and never friended him. And that would have been it. I'd have been fat and happy. But that bastard has kept on pecking and I've been getting fit because of it. Um, and then before this was coming on, I get a little text from him in Australia showing a buddy of his holding the book because he's got the book in Australia. So I'm floored by the response he's been getting. I, I really am humbled. And some of the videos, I've had girls crying. I've had guys getting all excited that, you know, they, they can now feel as though there is a way of doing it. Because I'm an East London bricklayer. So right. I can go toe to toe with anybody and go, hey. You want to give yourself excuses? You know, I never had any, you know, or right. more to the point, I had them all, yeah. you know, and I'm now walking down the red carpet with that one, John and Steven Tyler. You know, you don't have an excuse. Right. Um, and I think a lot of people are resonating to the fact that I never had silver spoons. I still don't know how to spell. Um, spell checkers had a awful job correcting this book. Um, and I don't read much. You know that. But uh, we managed to pull out a book, and anyone that's ever got an email from me knows that the grammar is like, it's all over the place. But it's resonating with people, and I'm very proud and humbled at it. Yeah, well, that's that's amazing. Um, let, let's let's go let's go into that for a minute because talk to us about ghostwriters because there's a whole story around ghostwriting uh, with this book. Because as I said, you know, I, <laughs> there was a doubt you could read. Because <laughs> uh, it was funny, because uh, for those of you, of course, the audience doesn't know, but you and I, like I said, we've known each other for eight years, and yes. I'd sent you the book, my last book when it came out, and I was like, How, how's the book, Steve? No response. Answers other things, avoids that. Three, four times, I go, you haven't read it, have you? Oh, shit, I haven't read it, darling, I haven't read it. I don't have time to read. Okay, no worries. So, so I, I've got these behind here, in these cabinets of a, a range of motorbike parts, whiskey, and books that people send me. And I just go and put them in there and I go, oh, that, I'm going to read it. 
Sure. And then I go looking for a carburetor and I open it up and there's a book and I'm like, oh, I didn't read that. So, no, I'm afraid they're going there to die. <laughs> so, t so tell us about your experience with ghostwriters. So this, this is um, very stupid and uh, ignorant to the way the system works, which was good for me because I didn't know anything about writing a book. Right. So I was able to kind of look at it and go, well, why is it done like that? And because of the circle that I'm in and knowing people like you, I know a lot of authors that know what to do. So I was able to reach out and I spoke to Jay Abraham, JJ Virgin, Brendan Bouchard, Lila, name the list. And I was able to speak to them and go, how do you do that? And I was amazed. I would speak to five people and get 10 different answers. Sure. So everyone's got their own opinion or two opinions. And there's published, unpublished, ghostwriters, self, self-written. So I went through this and I thought to myself, if I'm going to write a book, I want it to be my own voice. Right. And I want it to be my story and I want it to be my tone. I do not want to be diluted. That right. was something I knew. So I thought, well, I have to write the book then. So sat down, bit of the fizz, started typing away on this book. It was horrible. And I think maybe a month later, I had got halfway through the intro and got nowhere into a book. <laughs> and I told, the, I told the publishers and I told the agent, and they went, we'll get a ghostwriter. Now, here was the funny thing. For me, I didn't want a ghostwriter because as far as I was concerned, that was someone else writing the book and just sticking my name on it. And I kind of felt a bit swizzled about that. Sure. But I succumbed, and they wrote this book. And then something funny happened. The ghostwriter wasn't writing my book. They were translating my voice to be understood by a wider audience. Now, I would actually speak to my family and I'll go, yeah, uh, and we all do this. But how many times do you turn around to your kids and go, it's in the second, it's over. And they go, yeah, I know, Dad. And they go to the drawer that you were thinking about sure. because they're up they're in your head. Yeah. Okay. Or you say to your wife, yeah, the key's in my left. It's, you know, it's, and they went, oh, your left pocket. You, yeah, got it. And you're, you're in sync with each other. Yeah. But if you're now speaking to an entire thousands and millions of people that don't even know your name, right. you've, got to, you've got to make it impossible for them to misunderstand. And the first chapter I read of this ghostwriter had taken everything I said, not diluted it, but translated it into this language called English that everyone could understand, still kept my tone, yeah. still kept a bit of my cursing in there, still kept my brevity, my energy, hopefully my passion, um, but was able to translate it. The second I looked at that ghostwriter as a translator, That's it. my relationship changed. Right. So with the first, I know the first month they would say to me, okay, Steve, uh, be somewhere that you're comfortable, and it was here. I would right. literally have a motorcycle up there. I'd be working on the bike. I'd have an ear set in, and the guy would be like, so how did you do it? And we would talk for 45 minutes, and we did that three or four times a week for like a, a two, two or three-week period, and then he produced the first chapter. I hated that first period. I really did. And it wasn't until I read the first chapter. In fact, to be honest with you, I didn't. I gave it to my wife. And <laughs> of course. Back. Of course you didn't read it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, hold on a sec. Let me just go into the cabinet with my carburetor. Yeah. There's the first chapter. <laughs> yeah. So I gave it to her and I went, do you read this? Tell me what you think. And she came back and she went, you've got to read it. She said, because it's you, but in English. And... And she's British as well. So I was like, okay then. And he really did manage to capture my voice. And they split the ghostwriters halfway through to this, to this young lady, um, Melissa. And it was great. And they managed to just translate what I was saying into an easily, uh, uh, easily read manuscript. So I was very pleased. But the key is to, when something doesn't feel right, see if you've got the wrong perception. Because in that situation... I had the wrong perception of what a ghostwriter did. Second, I looked at him as a translator. Completely different relationship and everything was good and valuable. I think, I think it's interesting because, uh, you know, that I've written lots of books and I, I do write my own books. And I've been offered the ghostwriting thing. And I had exactly the same bias 
which is, it's not me, and I want to keep my voice. But I see great, I do actually know some really good ghostwriters now, and they're doing exactly what you said. They're great translators. They, they, they put the correct English in, but they don't lose the tone of who you are and your voice. And that's important. Because, you know, one of the things, you know this, I've been speaking about this for more than 20 years. Now it's a cool thing to talk about, which is authenticity. And the reason I actually don't talk about it anymore, well, I rarely talk about it, it's sometimes brought up by others, is because... I see so much f what I call faux authenticity, like faux fur. You know, it's like you're trying to be authentic by saying something you think authentic people say. And for people like you and I, that's why I brought up the ghostwriting thing. For people like you and I, that, that can be very frustrating. Because you you probably get that a lot, right? Oh, you're so authentic. Like, <sighs> well, what the fuck else would it be? Yeah, it's like someone it's like someone being raised that you actually breathe or drink water. Um, I remember last year the tagline that really pissed me off was 10x. Everything last year was 10x. In fact, funny enough, I spoke at a group last Saturday and I went into my rant about 10x, and the group was actually called 10x Mastermind, and I hadn't worked, I hadn't seen what they were called. But anyway, um, <laughs> there was me blasting, and they all start laughing. Um, but yeah, this word, the word this year is authenticity. I've got a good word, which I always like. I hate authenticity. I love transparency. Mm -hmm. You see, authenticity, what is that? You know, and you see a lot of people stand up there and all of a sudden start swearing and cursing for you to think they're authentic. Transparency is when it's impossible to misunderstand. I want to be impossible to misunderstand. You know, I am me. There's no layers. You know when I'm upset. You know when I'm happy. And I'm very easy to uh, resonate with or not. And that's exactly. where the transparency comes in. I've had people that I've communicated with and we've just gone, hey, we're not, we're not ticking all the boxes here. It's too much effort. I wish you all the best. I'm going to find someone else for you. And I found them a different host. I found them other firms. I've actually sent them other firms where I've gone, look, you're looking for more of this. It ain't us. We're not a fit, but I know a couple that I suspect will be a better fit for you. Right. And I think it's respectful to do that with people. Yeah, I do too. I'm all about, you know, one of my quotes is, is you can't lead from the fence. So get off the fence and shove everybody else off the fence. It doesn't matter which way they go, just get them off the fence. Yeah. And, and, you know, and, you know, one of your quotes that I, I read uh, this week that I really liked was around, um, uh, it's not about being uh, not making it so that you're understood, but making it impossible to be misunderstood. Yeah. What's the quote? There's a, there's a difference between being easy to understand and impossible to misunderstand. Yeah. I got that from Brian Kurtz and Joe Polish, but and it was one of those it was one of those conversations where they just flipped this off during a conversation, but it hit me like a bat in my testicles, and I just remember sitting there and just going, and I can't remember what they were chatting about. I can't remember anything else about, I'm sorry guys, but I can't remember any of it, but that little nugget changed my trajectory that second. And right. I wrote it down, if I could have tattooed it on my arm, I would have done. Yeah. And, I, now, and I, I make sure that everything I do now, I am impossible to misunderstand. That's, that's really, really cool. Now, you know, we're talking about authenticity, talking about transparency, um, but... There's also another piece in here for me that, that really resonates with your story, um, and that is being fraudulent or imposter syndrome. Because you and I are both, you know, we come from working class UK backgrounds. We're not qualified officially to have done what we've done. You, you even way beyond even what I have done. Did you ever f have a sense of, imposter syndrome did you ever feel like i shouldn't really be doing this i often think that i'm going to wake up in the morning to a bunch of people banging on the door and get arrested just because i'm having too much fun um, <laughs> that's not quite the same thing <laughs> yeah I, I know but there was there was a period that actually and you get a lot of authors stand up and a lot of speakers that stand up and they talk about that aha moment and it was when that cat lost its leg or they narrowly, they narrowly avoided death, 
you know. It's all these kind of stories, and I don't want to be cynical, but, you know, you get these people stand up on stage and say, I narrowly missed death because I was in America and there was, there was a, 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 an earthquake in Japan, but I narrowly missed death, you know. And you get these kind of people. I never had any of that, okay? Um, but one of my aha moments was when I was actually, and this sounds stupid, I was already eight years into what I was doing. I was credible. I was doing it well. And I was now working with Ferrari and Asprey, the uh, jewelers to the Queen of England, okay, mm -hmm. uh, the royal jewelers. And this was fantastic. I then became, I felt as though I was an imposter. Even though all of these people were clients, even though these people were paying me to be there, yeah. I now felt as though, oh, my God, you know, am I doing something wrong here? I remember going out, and I've always been a guy in a black T-shirt and jeans, always. Um, and I remember going out and buying suits and even buying a Ferrari just so I could turn up at an event and be the perception or be the image that I felt that you wanted me to be. Right. Now, what that was doing was it was making me do this. I was now wearing a suit of armor. I was right. now wearing a costume, and now, my friend Dove, trying to pronounce everything, sounded like a twat, just really trying to be someone who I wasn't because I thought that's who you wanted me to be. Right. And I found, weirdly, and again, this is sounding, oh, you poor bastard, my money started going up, okay? I started Ooh. to earn more money. Everyone's Ooh. expecting it for me to go, oh, I went broke. No, I started to make more money, and I started to get more depressed. Because the money I was making with was arseholes and flakes that I didn't resonate with because how could they? They didn't know who I was. I was the guy in the suit with the Ferrari. So I had no connection, no relationship with my top clients. I was making money, but I didn't understand them. They didn't know me. I couldn't just shoot the shit and have fun with them. I was getting depressed. And then I suddenly realized about the disconnect. Mm -hmm. And I suddenly felt that I that imposter syndrome and luckily, I thought to myself, this isn't me. I'd rather go broke as me than be rich as someone else. Yeah. And I, I literally just took my jackets off, put it, and they were beautiful suits, and stuck them. I went, no, I don't mind wearing a suit for the wife, but I'm not going to wear a suit because you think I need to. Right. So, and then I just started turning back up again. And the funny thing was, all of my clients that I'd made in that short period of time, they dropped by the wayside. Of course. Okay? they went away. Why wouldn't they? They didn't resonate with me, you know? Mm -hmm. But I found that by being me and be by being completely transparent, and now my energy was back because I wasn't being strangled by some fancy suit. I was up there going, hey, I'll have a whiskey. Don't stop them coming. Right, who are we going to talk to today? Right. Because I was now in my zone again and I wasn't uncomfortable with being me, Suddenly, I found that I had space and energy to get good clients. So my money over the next six months went back up again. Sure. But there was that horrible period where I wasn't. And here's a true story. Very depressed that I was making money and getting depressed and losing friends. Right. And my wife said to me, we can't understand what's happening here. You know, we had a beautiful apartment, beautiful car, beautiful suits. I said, I don't know. But there's an event going on down the road that I always go to. I'm going to go. And maybe the events are changing. Maybe the social dynamic of the crowd is changing. Of course, because it's got to be outside of you. It's got to be something external. Someone else. Could it be me? I'm perfect. Exactly. So, so I literally went, yeah, I'm going to shelve all that. And I literally put the black T-shirt on, jeans, jumped on my bike, went down to the event, went into the event, went to my usual corner, okay, put the helmet on the side and had a drink. Now, my idea was for that night, I was just going to drink and observe right. and see if maybe the crowd had changed. Because when things become too popular, like Bridgehampton Polo or Kentucky Derby, the crowd changes as sure, things get sure. more successful. I wondered if I was maybe in that lift. This guy came up to me halfway through the night that I'd known for ages, and bless him, I can't even remember his name. He was just one of these guys that I always bumped into every Thursday night, and he was always pal, buddy, you know, that kind of stuff. Right. Just a guy that you just met a lot. And he walked up, and I'd seen him every bloody month of this event, and he came up to me, and as he walked up to me, he went, Steve! And I remember this. I was like, I need to have a few more than me. And I was like, hey, how you doing? I'm feeling a little bit depressed. And he went, 
I haven't seen you in here for months. And it suddenly made me realize in that moment, I hadn't actually been there. So that drunken bum nailed it right. that I hadn't actually shown up. It got me very depressed. It got me very thankful. Got me a bit teary when he actually said that. Um, and I went home and I told my wife and I told her about this guy. And we made that conscious decision. Show up or don't, but or don't show up as someone else. Yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting. I've got a, a, an interesting similar story. Uh, and I may have told you this, that when I first started speaking, which is thirty, going to be 34 years ago, um, I didn't plan on being a speaker any more than you did. Um, and we'll get into your speaking career in a minute, but, but um, I didn't plan on being a speaker, but I had a, a good mate by the name of Steve uh, who owned a national menswear company in Australia. And I was living there and he, he back when I had other businesses, he would, and I would have these great chats, these deep philosophical conversations. And he just loved to come and talk to me about these neat things. And then one day he says to me, I want you to come speak to my uh, to all my managers, we're gonna have this board meeting of, of the area, uh, the state managers. I'm like, okay. I was, what do you mean? You want me to talk to them? He goes, I want you to come and speak for them. I'm like, I'm not a speaker. What are you talking about? And he's like, I want you. To, he's, he's come and speak. I go about what? He goes, anything you want. He goes, we have great conversation. You can speak about anything you want. I'm like, no, nah, I don't think so. And he's like, no, I want you to do it. And I said. Okay, how long for? He goes, an hour. I'm like, whoa, dude, an hour? Are you crazy? No way. Now it's a fucking warm-up. But you know, back then it was a freak-out. So I agreed to half an hour, but he said, but I have one condition. I'm thinking, oh, I'm in trouble. I know what I, you know. It's going to be something weird, right? And he says, the condition is you show up like this. Now, this was 1984, right? 1984. We all remember... Those of us who are older remember 1984. I was in my very early 20s. I had hair down past my chest, ringlet curls, natural, you know, the, the Howard uh, Howard Stern look, right? Big earrings you could hang parrots off, designer stubble, and, I, and I'd been a bodybuilder for four years. And, you know, in, the, in, your, in your early 20s and you're a bodybuilder, everything has to show those muscles, size wearing T-shirts that were too tight and ripped jeans. Now, I knew Steve because I actually bought beautiful suits from him. I liked suits. But when I wasn't wearing those suits, I was in T-shirts that were too tight. And I, and my hair that day was like this. And he said, the condition is you have to show up looking like this. I go, but Steve, I've got suits and I can put my hair in a ponytail. He goes, I don't want that. I want you to show up like this. I'm like, are you sure? He's like, yeah. So as arranged, I show up in the door and I put my head in the door and it's this long board table and all these guys are buttoned up tight in the 1980s, you know, looking like Gordon Gecko, you know, sitting around the desk and they're, and, they're, and, they're all, and I put my head in, which I've been instructed by him to do, so they see me and they're all giving me what, it, what you and I will understand as the fuck off nod, right? <laughs> which is like, fuck off, what are you doing there? Get out, you're in the wrong place, right? But I stick my face in and give them a big smile and, and they're like, and then suddenly Steve says, let's welcome our speaker, Dove. And clunk, jaws hit the desk. And I get up and I speak. Now, I'll tell you, I don't remember what I talked about, but I remember my opening. 1980s, early Australia. And I said, put your hand up if you're a racist. Well, there's no room in the world unless you're at a Ku Klux Klan meeting. They're going to put their hands up for that. So I said, okay, put your hand up if you would judge people by the way they look, the color of their skin, or their financial situation. Nobody put their hand up. And I said, you're a bunch of freaking liars. Every single one of you judged me by the way I looked. You decided how much money I had and how intelligent I was by the way that I look. What you don't know is I'm already one of your customers. I know Steve because I met him coming into your store. He makes my suits. I don't always look like this. Now, at that point, I figured I'd shit the bed. I look over at, I look over at Steve, and he looks like his face has been cut open because his grin is so big. If the story ended there, I would be the hero. There's no doubt about it. It went down fantastic. Steve was excited. Three, four weeks went away. He comes back to me. He goes, hey, Alistair wants to have you speak. Alistair owned another, men's, another national uh, clothing company. He says, he wants you to speak for his guys. I go, oh, great. I had a great time. What do I do? I go and research what a speaker should look like, like oh, you did. Yeah. I went away, bought a blue suit, white shirt, red tie, cut off my hair, 
I had this nasty ass mustache that looked like a dead caterpillar was on my lip. And I looked terrible. I went and did the presentation and died a death. It was horrible. And what's more is I did not, I was not, see, you think you're thick. It took me at least five years to learn that lesson. I did right. not get it. I didn't right. understand that. It was like, I thought I'd lost my mojo. I wasn't speaking right. I didn't realize I'd given away my authenticity for approval. I traded authenticity for approval, and it's, which is what you were doing, but you were just a quicker learner than me. So it's a very interesting take our tape between you and I on those two things. Yeah, yeah. But same, same, uh, same concepts, uh, same story. This is a leadership show. How would you define leadership? Because you've met some very powerful people from all walks of life, you know, through Joe, Joe Polish and, and, and the Genius Network and, and through your business and what it is that you do and who you serve. You meet many people in those leadership roles and I you do. and I both know some of it is full of shit and some of it is spectacular. How do you define leadership? Um, I've always... I've always been a great admirer of lead by example. Um, Elon Musk, one of my greatest heroes is, uh, and it's weird because I know everyone's there going, it's Richard Branson. It ain't. It's Jean-Paul de Juria. Oh, yeah. This is a guy. Paul Mitchell. Yeah. And Patron and um, uh, uh, solar panels. He dies into so much stuff. Um, but he is such a leader. He is such an inspirer. And he steps in and goes, look, I was doing this and I cut my fingers doing this. So let's not do that. But I found a way of doing it. Let's see if we can try it like this or if someone else can find. He will actually try stuff. Even today, as old as he is, and boy, that guy's knocking on. Um and Elon's the same. He'll go out there and he wants to get involved. I see these leaders. And they don't know what CRM program they're working on. They don't know. They don't know Susie from accounting. They don't. And it's hard. It's hard. And I, I've seen it myself. You're an entrepreneur. You start becoming se successful. You start recruiting people. And what happens is people get in the way of what you do well and you. Because now the more people you take on, you're getting further away from the front line. Absolutely. Good leaders push themselves back in the front line on a regular basis and go, hey, how are we doing this? Why are we doing it? They challenge it. Elon's a brilliant one that everyone knows challenges it. You know, someone says, right, well, we're going to do this. And he turns around and he says, well, why are we going to do this? Because of that. And then he says, but why? That's that. You're telling me something, but you're not giving me a reason for it. I need an explanation as to why we're doing this. And if you can't give me an explanation – then let's get one. This is a guy that nearly went bankrupt, and I don't think a lot of people know this, countless times. Sure. He sold PayPal, made a fortune, and then basically spent a load of it and then borrowed a load of money to do SpaceX, yep. which then kept on crashing, was openly ridiculed by NASA, who, by the way, is now his biggest client. Yes. And... It's, it's just strange how it's 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 stupid s millimeters before it's genius. And I'm a great believer that leaders get back on that front line regularly to see how it's being done and why it's being done. I, I couldn't agree more. It's stupid millimeters before it's genius. I think that that is so profoundly true. Uh, but we are so afraid of the ridicule. And this is oh, why psychologically, this is why people yeah. back off the accelerator before the finish line. Because if I go, oh, I could get ridiculed, I could be re rejected, and they back off. And the people we admire are people who don't. I saw this wonderful 60-minute interview with Elon Musk where he talked about the people who he held in high, high esteem, people he looked up at who ridiculed him. Yeah. Like, and, and, and you could see, you know, this because Elon Musk is pretty famous for not looking like shit gets to him. And you could see the guy was like swallowing golf balls making that statement mm. that the people he'd admired were shitting on him and now he had come out on top. But he, st he still felt the pain of being ridiculed by those people. But how amazing that he could keep going 
in the face of that. That for me is phenomenal. Yeah, he's. I'm. I'm proud to see that over the last ten to fifteen years. We've gone away from looking at, at Brad Pitt and nothing, not taking anything away from Brad Pitt, but we've stopped looking at Brad Pitt as superstars. And now our superstars are people like Elon Musk and Jean Paul Joria. And Shark Tank is giving us a new lineup of superstars. You know, my kids know who Mark Cuban is and Damon John and Jay Abraham. They know who these people are right. along the same way they know Lady Gaga and all these, but they go, oh, yeah, that's a singer. But this person made this, right. you know, and the kids know who Elon Musk is in the same way that you know people knew who Elvis was. Yeah, and, if, and the the downside of that is that I mean everybody wants to be famous. I get that. I understand where that comes from. And, and the new rock stars are entrepreneurs. There's no doubt about that. But the True. problem is everybody thinks they can be the next rock star. Just like, you know, when we were kids, we wanted to buy a guitar because we wanted to be in, we wanted to be the next version of the Who or whatever it was. But, and, you know, and not everybody's, not everybody has that ability. Not everybody has even the skin for that. It, 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 no, it's but, true. Just because just you own a pair of Vans and a hoodie doesn't make you a tech giant. No, <laughs> but a lot of people do tend to feel that way. One yeah. of the things you, you talked about is fire vampires. Tell us what a fire vampire is. So I like I, ages ago, I, I realized and I actually did a speech on it once and it wasn't planned, but it just came out this way. And I, had, I asked the audience, how many people um, know someone in their life, their circle, their business, vendors, partners? Hell, you could be sitting at the same table with them now that you just don't like communicating with. You haven't got to name them. You haven't got to point them out. But put, put your hands up if you've got someone in your circle you don't like, okay? Mm-hmm. Basically, Every everyone hand put your hands up, yeah. okay? And I said to them, do you know the bad thing is? They actually spoke to your wife last week. They phoned up your best clients last week. They spoke to your kids without you knowing it. And, of course, they sit there and they go, that's not possible, But the trouble is, when you're talking to someone that doesn't resonate with you, you kind of take this breath and you're like, all right, uh, John, um, what I'm trying to say is, look, could we we not? Hey, look, come on. And you change and you compensate and you try to connect with that person. And there's so much effort that you're now spending on trying to communicate with that someone that you're building up an internal cancer. Mm-hmm. And then what happens is you get off the phone and your wife says something and you go, what? And you buy, how many times have we spoken to someone that we care about, friends, family, wife, husband, boyfriend, kids, and they've turned around and they've gone, whoa, hang on a minute. Don't bite my head off. It wasn't exactly. me. And you, hey, look, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Well, here's the danger. That person has a relationship with you strong enough that can challenge your mood. But if you're dealing with a fresh client, that's a new relationship. Yeah. And that person's going, well, that dove's a moody bastard. Right. You know? God. They won't challenge you. They just won't take your calls anymore. Exactly. And so what I made a conscious decision on is that I will quite happily, every single day, every single hour, phone or contact or connect with 10 people I love. It's no effort. In fact, it's a desire. You're like, I, I, I told you at the beginning of this. I was thrilled when I saw that it was your name on there because we know each other. Right. You know, we are legitimately, authentically friends. Right. And I, I, I love you, man. I think you're great. So I was thrilled when we got the chance to have this call because I knew I didn't have to put anything on. I was, I was chatting with Dove. Game right. on. And that made it good. But when it's someone that you don't like, you don't want to make that call. If I said to you, phone 10 friends in the next hour – You'd probably get through maybe three because you'd have long conversations. Exactly. No way in the world I could get through 10 friends in an hour. But if I phone, if I told you to phone one person you didn't like in the next hour, you'd think of every reason not for it to happen, and more than likely it wouldn't happen. Right. Because you don't want to. So I went through my life, and I went, well, okay. And I literally did these circles. Who do I love? Ah, it's my wife, Dove, my dogs. I've got three kids. Some of the kids are in where I love. You know, it's just all that kind of thing. Who don't I love? Well, there's the other kids I don't, you know. So all this kind of stuff's going on. I suddenly started realizing that there were vendors in there I didn't like. 
I can get other vendors. You're gone. Right. Hang on a minute. I'm now seeing that there's some of my top salespeople in here. But they make me really good money. Yeah, but they piss me off. Yeah, but I don't want to talk to them. But yeah, they make me really money. The excuse is always they made me good money. If that was the only one excuse, but I had 20,000 other reasons to get rid of them, I thought, I'm going to get rid of them and see what happened. Do you know what happened? It was literally like cutting cancer out of your company. All of a sudden, everyone was like, Phew, I had people that had gone out with these people saying to me, thank you. I didn't know if you were ever going to do that. Right. And I was like, shit, why do you say, well, we couldn't say anything. It's not our place. Of course, it's not your place. It's my place. Right. I'm the yeah. one that has to cut out the cancer. I found that everyone was more energetic and the money you lost by firing one of your top salespeople with the energy and the focus, you got it back. Maybe they run off with some of those clients, but you got other clients back. So I literally focused on it. Anyone that is not positive, anyone that's just constantly there to say, no, no, I don't like, oh, I don't want to do it. Get rid of them because they are phoning your clients and your family and screwing up your relationships. Fire the vampires. I, I am so, so with you on that. I, one of the things we talk about corporately is if you've got a diva in your company who's making you a lot of money, they're costing you more than they're making you. Yep. And it's the same thing because they suck the life out of everybody else and nobody can perform as well as they could perform if that person was gone. And you're, I fully agree with you. They're absolutely on the same page. One of the, as you know, a lot of the work that I do, I work with individuals, I work with organizations around purpose. We're looking at purpose. What is the sole purpose of an individual? What is, what is the purpose? What is it that drives you, Steve? What do you, what would you say is your purpose? Do you know, I, there's this, there's this guy called Brian Scrown. Um, I, I don't know if you know Brian. Do you know Brian? 1-800-GOT-JUNK? No, that's uh, Cameron Howard. Um, no, no, no. The Cameron, Cameron, I know Cameron because I, I was chatting to Cameron yesterday. But no, right. it was it was who who who, who Cameron used to work with. It uh, It's Brian, but I think the last name is wrong. I've gotten the last name wrong. Yeah, so Brian Scrum's down in Florida. Decent guy. I remember I always had trouble telling people what I did for a living. In fact, nine times out of ten, I never did. Um, people would be introduced to me and they would go, oh, this is Steve. He does this, this, and there would be like a little intro, okay? But if I met someone in a bar, you know, and I remember when we first met, you know, there wasn't a lot of conversation, but I felt as though there was something good. And then it was that second conversation that we started forming a relationship. Right. But I'm the guy that's going to stand there and go, hey, yeah, Forbes calls me the real life Wizard of Oz. I'm freaking awesome. I, you know, I just don't want to do that. No. I have to tell people I'm a plumber. But... Um, Brian Scrone actually turned around to someone once and went, meet Steve, he sells smiles. And that was how Brian introduced me. And I was like, damn, that's good, you know? Yeah. <coughs> and I suddenly realized I like to have people smiling. I want you to wake up at 2 o'clock in the morning flustered in a sweat because you managed to go somewhere, meet someone, do something, experience something that could never have been done hadn't there been a person called Steve Sims in your life. And that actually makes me feel very proud. And I get to look at Facebook, I get to look at Instagram, and I get to see these people, you know, playing drums with Guns N' Roses, singing with Journey, driving in a Formula One car. I've got a client the other day did a two-seater drag race at 200, I think it was 90 mile an hour or something, in a bloody drag strip. And he sent me a video, and he's going on about it. And I just got a little tag in it. Thanks, Sims. He didn't even hyperlink me. I didn't care. No. You know, this guy was so thrilled that he got to do his thing, and it was it was thanks to me. And I that's that's what drives me. I get to live vicariously through people's passions, dreams, desires, and I get to to can I wave my little magic wand and charge them a lot of money and get to do these wonderful things around the world. So. It's the passion and the energy and the fulfillment that drive me. That's really cool, man. That is very cool. I like I like that uh, sell smiles. But like you yeah. said, it's the ability to to have an experience that would never have taken place without you. And yeah. that's a pretty that's a pretty cool thing. One of the things I um, one of the things I want to talk about about you. I mean, you've been on all these shows. You're talking about the book, and we've not really talked that much about the book because I want people to actually have an experience of you. Um, 
But one of the things that I don't know if you're talking about much anymore, but is your charity. Because I was part of that that original mm. marketing piece and we did the yeah. little video and all that. Is that still going on? Are you still doing that? I will be. Um, I actually stopped it about six months ago. I am astounded why charities and America, well, it's not just America, sadly. It's any, it's like America, Canada, Europe. Yep. Do everything possible to make it hard for you to raise money for charity. Yeah. They get in the way because so many people um, used foundations and charities to basically siphon money during the two recessions we had over the last 20 years. They really scrutinize how funding and foundations work yeah. so and trusts. So being able to do something, the amount of red tape that it took to finally be able to go, okay, I'm going to promote this. I'm going to raise $100,000 and you're going to get all of it. You'd spent six months doing it when all you wanted to do, just go, look, I don't want any money. And it was really, really tough. So I am a great believer in being selfish. I'm a great believer in what's in it for me. Right. And I believe until you're selfish and stable, you're not in a strong enough position to help anybody else. So I really believe be the best and strong as you could be. And then when you're in that position, then help others. So with the book coming out, which as you hit on right at the beginning, has got me into a much wider audience. Of course. Okay. And I see my um, my registrations on the Bluefish and uh, Steve D. Sims just just going stupid uh, yeah. each day with people signing up on those on those newsletters. As that builds up, and I take the next chapter and grow in that. Then I can backpedal and go, well, hang on, boys. Who wants to help me with this? Right. And I bring Blue Cores back up. But a couple of years ago, um, it was so much effort. Um, it really was great for me to do. I love being able to find a charity, a cause, a wish, marry them together, seeing the money, uh, seeing the money hop over me. None of it went through us. Oh, I know. That's why I wanted to bring it up because I know you were taking no money. Yeah, no, we noticed that the first thing is the second you take money for any charitable foundations, the stipulations are huge. So we turned around and we went, but we don't want the money. Right. And they said, well, then you'd have to have the client actually pay the charity direct. And we were like, bingo. And so that's what we did. We yep. would do all the construction in the middle and then have it leapfrog over. But even then, you would find up a charity and go, look, I know you're working with Lady Gaga. I've got a client who wants to do this, this, this. I can do this. I just need to be able to let him know he could do this. And they were like, oh, we're not sure. Well, what are you not sure about? That she will do it? Because I know she will do it because she did it last Tuesday. I researched this shit. And they were like, yeah, but she's very hard. to." I'm like, Jesus, there's a quarter of a million dollars here. Do you want the money? And nine times out of ten, they would be so cynical that it would actually happen that they bailed yeah, or you get companies out there that take so much money. There's a lot of charities out there now and I'm going to call them out. There's a lot of companies out there like, um, uh, charity buzz, uh, uh, um, Omaze, Prizio, all of these companies take massive chunks out of the money for marketing right. that the charities are not getting all the money. Yeah. And that's why I really appreciate about what you're doing. It was, it was all about, about, I tried. it was great. So you, you know, I touched on my speaking career, but, you know, you didn't plan on being a speaker either. And, and I remember when you first, when we first met and you were saying, yeah, I'm thinking about doing a bit of speaking, but not like you. I just want to do a bit. Since then, you know, you've spoken at far more prestigious places than I have. You've spoken at the Pentagon. Um, you've spoken at Harvard and, you know, like I said, Genius Network and many other places. <laughs> What's that been like for you? And, and tell us about your prep. What is your prep for speaking at these things? Well, here's, here's my prep. <laughs> um, so I, I literally just, uh, I, had a, I had secret sauce in my back pocket. So my, my, my thought first was, okay, you want me to speak at your event? You know, who's in the audience? What do you think you want me to talk about? That was always the key question. Right, I right. never said what I would talk about. What do you think I'm going to talk about? And so I would get those two understandings first. All right, great. 
Um, and then I would think to myself, well, if this fails, well, first of all, what, why am I up there? Am I up there to get leads for Bluefish? Am I up there to get speak, speaking gigs? Am I up there to get more consulting gigs? Am I up there because I like the sound of my own voice and I want to dance around on a fancy stage? Um, you know, what is in it for me? Again, that selfish bit. Right. right. And then I would think to myself, well, if it fails, my lights are still on. I've still got enough whiskey. I've still got gas in the tank. So, you know, I have no physical or financial downside. Um, and so that gave me a lot more comfort. So I would quite often go up on stage and go, hey, my name's Steve Sims. And I, I, did, I learned very early on from um, Joe Walden and from Joe Polish, um, don't let anyone else introduce you onto a stage, okay? That so you haven't given the direct instructions to do. And then I learned from Joe Polish to actually a video speaks more than words. So I actually spoke to one of Joe's friends and I got like a little, uh, I think it's like 30 second video that they play before I go up. And there's me with like Richard Branson and Elon Musk and the actual voiceovers by Morgan Freeman. And it's just all very impressive. Um, and so by the time I come up on stage, they're like, whoa. And I can go up on stage and go, right, what do you want me to talk about? Here's three subjects. Right. You know, right. and I will do that or I will go, look, I hear you're marketing majors, which means you're obviously fucking geniuses. So let's tear that down and work out why you're actually not, you know? Right. And I would be able to go up there and I always believed that I was never a speaker. I was a conversationalist. I wanted to go on there and I wanted to interact with the audience. So I would walk up to parts of the stage and I'd be like, look, is this resonating with you? If not, we can shut it down now and we can talk about something else. Right. You know, if it is, what's catching your fancy? So I was a great conversationalist on that, but this was something that bothered me and it really aggravated me. I hate the woohoo floozies. I hate those, those pricks that go on stage and they go, be the light within. You can be great, you know, give, give yourself to what, you know, and it's all that kind of stuff. And I would be like, oh, my God, I always wanted to leave the stage giving you two things to make you better than when you walked into the room. And so I was a great believer that it was my uh, my duty to go in there and give you something. So I would try and go in there and go, look, this is a this is a society that does this. Do any of you do this? Why not? I'm going to give you three things that I thought of. And it's amazing how so many people, when you're not in that sandpit, can see a much better view than you. Of course. So I'm able to go in there and go, look, I hear you do this. Can anyone put their hands up and tell me in, in like less than 100 words why you do that? And then some people stand up and go, because the boss told us to say it. You right. know? And it would be those kind of things. So... I ended up with that tone and with that, I won't say disregard for the downside, but I didn't have a downside. Mm -hmm. So I was able to go on there. And you're right, I ended up speaking in the Pentagon. I remember speaking at the Pentagon. I said, I'm going to be really polite here because all of you guys are probably carrying very large weapons and you all probably know where I live. <laughs> <laughs> this was the Pentagon, for God's sake. Um, and, you know, I managed to speak there. I spoke at Harvard, Stanford. Um, so it's been, it's been pretty amazing. I never even went to college. Um, and here Barely I am. Barely finished school. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. And there I am walking on. I did Harvard twice. And I remember the second time I went there, I thought, I thought you would have fuckers learned from the last time. But I'm back, you know. And it was just, it was kind of comical. But I've never really taken it too seriously. And I think... I'm very wary of the story that we both communicated about the suit. Again, I'm very wary to make sure that I don't actually change that. I went down, to a, uh, I gave a, a brilliant talk. Well, it wasn't brilliant for me, but it was a brilliant event. Uh, I gave a talk to last Saturday and um, I rolled up on my motorbike and I walked into the event, crash helmet, stuck the crash helmet down and walked on black t-shirt jeans and started chatting with everyone. So I'm very aware that I cannot afford to change who I am or what's made me who I am. 
Yeah. You and I are definitely on the same page on that. I love that about you, my man. You know, you said that you, you know, you always have this sense that you want to make sure they leave with a couple of things that they didn't have before you got there. What is the one thing you want to make sure that our viewers, our listeners, what's the one practical thing you want them to get out of this show that they will go away and put into action? Um, don't be frightened of failure. You're taught as children, as you brought it up earlier, to be humiliated if you ask three times or to be ridiculed if you fall over or if you trip, okay? Every single successful person out there is a massive, massive, massive failure. It just didn't define their end result. They just learned from it. So mm -hmm. failure is your feedback on what not to do. Be proud of learning those lessons. So don't be embarrassed. Be proud to fail and to wear those scars with pride. So, but just let's talk to that for a minute from a psychological point of view, because that's the kind of shit, like the 10x thing that's thrown around, around, you know, fail forward and all that kind of stuff. But at the same time, not everybody's that thick skinned and a lot of people feel just freaking devastated. How do you get them up? How, how, what would you say to them to get them up? The sad thing is that's because a lot of those people have those vampires around them. People don't always like people growing. They don't like people being successful because it validates how inaccurate they are. So when you've got those people around you, if your five best friends are assholes, guess what you are. Exactly. So get into a better sandbox. Um, when you fall over, you want to be able to look up and all you can see is hands for people ready to pick you back up again. Those are the friends you want. And I've got them from captains of industry to, to biker boys in England. So those are the boys in my family and the girls that will stick a hand out and go, time to get it back up, Sims. Um, and that's what you need. So you first of all got to make sure that your circle is worthwhile. It's a circle you want to be proud of. It's a group of people that you would want to boast about that are your people. And then try something and just go, shit, that didn't work. My dad, thick-headed Irish bloke, I remember this years ago. And, oh, my God, it was the weirdest thing in the world. We're walking down London. He's not looking at me. I'm walking next to him. I don't even know where we were going. I forget. As we're walking, without him looking at me, he puts his hand on my shoulder. We hadn't spoke for about 10 minutes. He's smoking a cigarette, which he did 24-7. And he puts his hand on my shoulders doesn't look at me and he went, son, no one drowned by falling in the water. They drowned by staying there. Takes his hand off my shoulder, carries on walking. I'm 16 years old or 13 years old. And I'm like, what was that? You know? Exactly. <laughs> I have no idea where that came from. I exactly. had no idea how to respond. We had no further conversation, but I'm walking down the road going, you know, yeah. had no yeah. idea. It wasn't until years later when I lost money on projects, which I gambled with taking on partners, which I shouldn't have, where I trusted people because they had fancier suits than me or they could speak better or they went to a nice school. Then I suddenly realized, hang on a minute. You, I, I'm not I'm not I'm not staying down. You know, I fell down, but that taught me not to do. So therefore, if something teaches you something, you've just learned something. Yeah, I class yeah. myself now, maybe arrogant, as an incredibly educated individual. But school had absolutely nothing, nothing to do, to do with, that. with that. So that's my uh, that's my philosophy there. You may call it fail forward, but just be don't be frightened to ask questions. Don't be embarrassed when you trip. Yeah, but I like what you're saying there about about the piece of um, that humiliation is probably because you've got people around you who would re hum humiliate you. And you yeah. need better people. I remember when I was when I was fifteen and I was dating this girl. And I was hanging out at uh, mom and dad's house in in Manchester. And I said, um, "Yeah, I'm thinking. I already had a job. I was already working. I was like, yeah, 'Yeah, I'm thinking about leaving here and and, and starting my own business.' And, and her dad, who was a union lad, was like, "Well, I wouldn't do that." As he drinking his homebrew beer, I wouldn't do that. Smoking his ciggy like your dad. And I said, why not? He goes, you need a decent job with a bloody union. That's what you need if you're going to be stable in life. And I was like, yeah. And I actually went away and thought, yeah, he's probably right. Because, you know, he was he was in his early 40s and I was a kid. 
and I went away, and then I went, and I don't know what happened, but something happened in my coconut, and I went, do I want to be Jack? Do I yeah. want to be that guy in his living room, drinking freaking homebrew beer, smoking ciggies in a union job when I'm 40? I'm like, hell no. Why the hell am I listening to people who are giving me advice who are not where I want to be? That's just dumb. I was like, okay, started the business. <laughs> now, did I fail? Absolutely. But did I get up and not drown in three inches of water? Yeah, I did. So you're absolutely right. I love it. Listen, Steve, it has been awesome having you here, mate. The time has flown by. Of course it would, because that's how it is. You and me having a chat. <laughs> Please tell our viewers, our listeners, where they can find out more about you. They can find out about the book, all those kinds of things. Well, the book's called Blue Fishing, The Art of Making Things Happen. Uh, it's on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Usual Suspects. You can find it also, the links on stevedsims.com. That's S-I-M-S. You can find out about Bluefish on thebluefish.com. And if you look up Steve D. Sims on any of the, you know, Insta Jams, Twitters, uh, Facebook, you'll find my uh, very attractive mug on there so you can follow along. Yeah, and we will definitely make sure that all the links are posted in the show notes as well. It's been great having you here, mate. I hope you'll stay with us till the end. I want to thank everybody else for tuning in. And I want to say, as always, listen, this was a this was a great show, but it absolutely is worth zero. It's worth the hole in the donut if you don't do anything with it. So don't just have it listening on in the background while you're while you're fixing your carburetor. Actually do something with it. Get a pen out, get a paper out, take some notes on it, listen to it the second time. I promise you, you'll get more out of it the second time than you did the first. There was loads of gems in this show, and you got to really see what it's like to be in the world of Steve Sims, not just because he's highly influential with all these great guys, but you get to see the philosophy of what's made that happen because Steve is transparent and real. And that is actually part of the golden the golden key is be you. And everybody says that and nobody knows what the hell it means. But it really is about stop putting on the airs and graces. Stop pretending you're what you're supposed to be. Don't be me when I started my speaking career. Do something better. <laughs> and I want to remind you that the research consistently shows that one of the biggest challenges facing the most successful companies is often counterintuitive that the fastest growing companies hit the point where they realize that they're spending a fortune attracting, training, and developing talent only to have them leave them at an alarming rate. If you're sick of investing in training talent and then only having them leave you before you get your ROI, reach out to us at fullmontyleadership.com, providing you with the essential leadership skills to rekindle and amplify the hidden loyalty assets of your organization by having you tap into the purpose, the true purpose. It's your the why of your why as a leader and as an organization, fullmontyleadership.com, providing you with the concrete soft skills to get you and your organization to the top and keep you there. Why? Because you can't outsource true authenticity, true transparency. Remember, get yourself over to The Matrix as well, matrix.fullmontyleadership.com. Till next time, this is Dov Barron, and I am always here to assist you in tapping into your own deep greatness so next time, this is Dov Barron saying, stay curious, my friend. Stay curious, and I'm out.